Great. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, yeah, so I wasn't quite sure what the <laughs> the theme of the talk should be, so I kind of figured it would just be sort of, uh, I basically assumed everyone at least had a basic understanding of what climate models are and things like that, and a general sense of isotope modeling. Uh, so I figured I'd just kind of describe what's the, um, like, what's been the most recent advancements and upgrades and, you know, and uh, other sorts of new model features or uh, capabilities that are out there, and then, you know, some, like, concerns in the end. So, yeah, let's just dive right into it, see if this works. That did not work. Let's try this. All right. So if you want to just quit right now, you can, uh, instead of listening to me, you can go and read uh, several kind of reviews of models uh, and, or water isotopes and models, including um, uh, one of Dave Taper, Keiyoshi Mora's, and uh, Joe Galuski's paper. Um, one of the things I'm not going to cover in the talk of kind of the history of modeling, starting with like uh, Sylvie Giussime or however her name is pronounced, and John Giselle. Uh, but if you are interested in the history, uh, I certainly I'd recommend these uh, um, reviews. They're they're probably the best way to get into that. Uh, the other thing I'm not discussing in this talk are what I would guess describe as mathematical or idealized models. You know, think of like the Rayleigh model or the Craig and Gordon model. You know, they're all, uh, they're all obviously important, but I figured when we were referring to modeling, we're referring to kind of numerical models. Um, that doesn't mean though that we should just ignore these kind of idealized models. You know, even recently Adriana had a paper describing like a 1D model. Uh, I think those are really valuable in my mind. Those are most valuable in kind of the interpretation of, of water isotope results, either from observations or from numerical models. And so I figured those would be better discussed in kind of like future uh, discussions. Uh, but you can certainly collect uh, references for them. And if, stop me at any time if somebody wants to. So, you know, just interrupt me. Okay, so first question is why isotope enabled models in the first place? Um, you know, I kind of think of two major drivers for this. First one is that, you know, with modern observations, water can really be used to identify, constrain, and improve, uh, I would guess I vaguely label them as issues in climate model processes. Um, really think of that as like they can be used as ways to constrain uh, parameterizations or the dynamics or uh, the variability in climate models, right? So if you imagine this, classic, you know, boxes with arrows going to them in the lower left, right? Like water isotopes are sensitive to things like evaporation and precipitation and your, the condition of your clouds and atmosphere biosphere interactions and vegetation and basically everything related to the hydrologic cycle has some impact. So, you know, if your model has imperfect physics, you can imagine that that would reflect itself in the water isotopes, essentially in a unique way that's not, uh, you can't necessarily gather from just looking at, say, water alone. The uh, second reason uh, is ultimately, you know, uh, for paleoclimate, right? Well, I don't need to tell half the people here is uh, many, many proxy records are based off water isotopes. And by uh, developing water isotope-enabled climate models, um, it allows for, uh, it basically provides an additional tool to better interpret um, those records and, and then compare them to the model results. Uh, and, you know, I figured, again, this would be something that we'll discuss more when we go into, like, proxy system models and uh, um, data assimilation and things like that. But those techniques are benefited by the fact of having isotopes in the climate models themselves. All right. Uh, so to start off, uh, you know, there's different levels of even numerical climate models, and one that we, I guess, no, we don't have folks here, uh, at least on the modeling side, that do it. But you know, there's there's kind of the big GCMs, and there's also intermediate complexity models, and a lot of intermediate complexity models uh, have water isotopes in them, including like the ones I list here, like I Love Clem and uh, Speedier and Uvic. Um, you know, they have some. Of course, they're not as complex as like the IPCC class GCMs or climate models, but you know they, they're much computationally cheaper and faster, and so they have advantages like they can be run over really long times, 
So if you want to do like paleoceanographic things where you're, you know, having your AMOC, you know, your meridional overturning change a lot, or if you want to run a huge ensemble, like with hundreds of members, then emix are a good option. Um, the other thing which I didn't write here, uh, which is a benefit, is they're a great way to try to better understand um, physics processes that might show up in larger climate models that you need to kind of deduce what the what's driving it. So, right, for example, if you have some bias in your full in your full GCM or your fully complex GCM, um, and you think it's due to the way the ocean dynamics is managed, you could try running it in an EMIC and see if you get the same or an intermediate complexity model and see if you get the same biases, right? And if you don't, then maybe uh, it's saying that it's some process that's in one of the models and not the other, or vice versa. All right, so for most, I feel like, and of course, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like, of course, their goal is on kind of these large IPCC, you know, CMIP level climate models. So the last, I guess, like official kind of collection of these models uh, that Rice have enabled was SWING 2, which is, uh, I think it's the Stable Water Intercomparison Group 2, and we'll go with that. Uh, but essentially, it's kind of like a MIP for water isotope-enabled models. And as you can see here, um, you know, several papers have been written on it. Like this, I stole this table from Jess Conroy's work in 2013. Uh, you know, Camille Risi had work on it in 2012. Um, and, you know, so several interesting studies have come out of this. And it's still, this data set's still here, and it's certainly, I think, still available to kind of be uh, dredge through to find out new understandings uh, of water isotopes and models. The one problem with it is that some of these models are out of date, right? So, you know, CAM, ECM, GIS model, and G ISO GSM have all kind of been upgraded since the last time at least these models have um, uh, come to fruition. Now, some of these changes are probably not going to influence water isotopes per se that much. Uh, but there's still, you know, the model system as a whole has changed. So that means things like the physical climate might be different. And so then the relationships between water isotopes and the climate might be different in the model. Uh, given that, you know, maybe there's a, and we can discuss this, maybe there's a motivation to kind of redo swing or make a new isomip or something equivalent to that. Uh, another kind of key advancement that's happened since the swing two has been uh, kind of an increase in fully coupled models. And so for folks who don't hang around climate models all day, when I mean fully coupled, what I mean is instead of being just an atmosphere or just an ocean with kind of boundary conditions, it's the atmosphere and the ocean. And usually nowadays it also includes the land surface and sea ice. And land ice is kind of entering, but at this stage it's probably, you know, I wouldn't include it. Um, you know, fully coupled models are important, particularly for paleoclimate simulations. Uh, right, we don't have observations of the sea surface temperature in the, you know, Pliocene. So we have to generate that, you know, proxy data is one, but we also need to use fully coupled models to kind of get an estimate of that. Um, and from the isotope standpoint, what's been significant is that the number of these fully uh, coupled isotope enabled GCMs is kind of I don't want to say exploded, but it's grown rapidly. Um, so from Swing 2, the two models that I knew of that weren't uh, intermediate complexity, that were fully coupled was HADCM3, which is the British UK model, and then the GIS model, which although itself has been upgraded, the original Swing 2 is model E, and now we're on E2.1. Um, since that time, however, um, we've added new fully coupled models. One is like Martin's work with uh, MPIESM, uh, I, I brand these with ECM-5 because it's unclear. I know ECM-6 is in existence, but the paper that I found was with ECM-5. But regardless, like the full, there's a fully isotope enabled version of the MPI model. There's a fully isotope enabled version of NCAR CESM model. Um, and also other models that I haven't found citations for, but I kind of have heard through the grapevine uh, that are working on being fully coupled include the IPSL model, EC-Earth, and GFDL. Um, so, you know, this kind of opens up a new, another kind of motivation that maybe we should either add on to Swing 2 or do a new MIP. Um, so, you know, real quick, we always think about 
atmosphere models, but um, there have been several, you know, published ocean models that I wanted to that weren't necessarily cited in the original swing, uh, or they're just cited in the internal swing papers. Um, and you know, those include again the MPI uh, ocean model, the GIS model, and uh, POP2 and CARS ocean model. Other ones that I know as well include, again, the hadcn 3s ocean model, and then NEMO, which is IPSL, which I, my understanding is in existence, but I haven't found a citation for it. Um, you know, and the advantage of ocean models, usually don't talk about ice enabled ocean models a lot uh, compared to the atmosphere, but if you're doing, you know, a lot of our paleo kind of proxies are in the ocean, right? They're marine cores or they're corals or things like that, and so... You know, if you need, a lot of those things need the O18 per se of seawater, and the way to compare that in a model is with the uh, you know, isotope enabled ocean model. The other kind of like rapidly growing section of modeling uh, is, is land surface models. Um, you know, here's a big list. And, you know, the land surface, you always need some sort of land surface model uh, with an atmosphere, even if it's just kind of a simple scheme. Uh, but recently, there's been a real growth in the number of kind of uh, more complex land surface models, right? Land surface models that have kind of, you know, vegetation or biosphere interactions, uh, you know, complex soil hydrology, things like that. Um, this is vital, again, not, from a, not only from a paleoclimate side, because, of course, there's terrestrial proxies that you'd want to uh, compare with the land surface model results, but also because there's a real opportunity to constrain actual like modern day physical processes, right? Things like soil hydrology uh, or evaporation versus transpiration, uh, you know, the, the transport of water through plants and cells or runoff via rivers, snow processes, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's, I didn't list them because there's almost too many, right? It's entire kind of subfield, isotope hydrology. So um, land surface, isotope enabled land surface models give us a chance to really, uh, potentially constrain these processes in climate models. And that's especially true when we're combining it with things um, which we'll probably talk about in the next talk in a few weeks. Uh, you know, kind of like the um, increased use of the of uh, spectrometers that allow like high frequency uh, observations in situ, right? Like the CAROs and LGRs and things like that. Um, they allow us to really potentially nail down or at least better constrain a lot of land service processes which are currently poorly observed, or at least not nearly as well constrained as uh, the atmosphere or even the ocean. Uh, there's also kind of other model capabilities that don't really fit into like particular spheres like the land service or the ocean, uh, but are still important to know of because they're beneficial when doing uh, research. One of those is kind of um, the, addition, the addition of single column models which is where you have, instead of having your full global climate model, you're just taking kind of one grid cell and you're running that grid cell in the vertical. Um, this is the advantage, of course, being cheaper and allows you to kind of uh, uh, really test, you know, say the convection or the cloud physics or the land service of that model for just one particular site. Um, and so it's used a lot, for example, in atmospheric science to try to, to improve parameterizations. Another um, kind of future improvement uh, will be in what's known as high top models. Uh, so most climate models tend to, you know, they have to have a top, and a lot of those tops tend to kind of end somewhere in the stratosphere. But we now kind of come into the understanding that stratospheric dynamics is important, and so a lot of models are now increasing the tops of their models up into even the mesosphere or uh, beyond try to fully capture the stratospheric uh, circulation and the chemistry. Where it matters to us and why water and ice tips matter, this is one of the un big unknown questions is what controls uh, the water uh, or the amount of water in the stratosphere itself, which plays an important role for things like the water vapor feedback and even climate sensitivity. Um, it's kind of still unknown, right, how, how what's the role of things like uh, convection or, you know, like thunderstorms and shooting moisture up as opposed to kind of this like longer time scale dynamical lift. Um, and water isotopes potentially are one of the mechanisms that we can use to really um, can, uh, 
better understand, you know, these mechanisms or constrain these mechanisms. And again, combined with um, kind of a new suite of satellites that can observe water uh, in the stratosphere, uh, this is really, I think there's really a potential uh, for future both model development and process understanding. Uh, finally, one thing that water, adding water isotopes to models gives you an advantage of is they all allow you to then do water tracing or water tagging. Um, part of the reason they have so many citations here is because uh, for almost any model, once you add in the kind of the code needed to do water isotope processes, you've added the code to do water tracing. Uh, so almost every water isotope meal model is capable of doing water tagging and water tracing, which allows you to, in the model at least, to quantify where the water is coming from, right? What is the actual source of moisture? How much uh, moisture recycling is going on? Things like that, right? So, you know, a lot of the paleo, or when we think of like the Rayleigh model, one of the uncertainties is uh, what's your moisture source or what's your starting point? Uh, and in model space, at least, with water tagging, you can actually define that, right? You know where your starting point is. Um, the problem, of course, is we don't have an equivalent besides any water isotopes in the real world. So there needs to be a way to kind of observationally constrain those results. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I also wanted to spend some time, because, again, we have a lot of kind of global modelers, uh, we want to spend a little bit of time talking about high resolution modeling. And what I mean by this is like high spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, these models are really important um, for several reasons, even though, you know, this group may not think about them a lot. And one is, is that in general, high resolution models are excellent for kind of process level studies. And particularly if you think about things like field campaigns, like a field campaign would take up maybe one GCM grid box. So it's hard to constrain the processes in, in a GCM with that. However, with high resolution models, you might be able to better capture those features and be able to say something, uh, uh, say, or at least say more about whatever your field campaign shows using uh, these higher resolution models. Uh, they also can be used to downscale, right? This is always, this is kind of, a dilemma, I guess, in my mind, in terms of paleoclimate modeling in general, right, is that a lot of paleoclimate proxies, for completely understandable reasons, are in places like, uh, you know, places that are, don't always necessarily represent the most of the global climate. So think about, like, Antarctica or, like, the glacier on the top of the Andes. Like, those, I completely understand why proxies are collected there, but it's going to be really, really hard for climate models that are designed to represent the planet to capture that glacier in the top of the Andes. Uh, however, if you had a higher resolution model that you can force with boundary conditions, you might be able to capture, say, the topography of the Andes or of Antarctica and potentially kind of better resolve those local features which might be contaminating uh, your results. Um, finally, uh, just kind of throwing this out there, there is a potential uh, if water isotopes can be used to improve climate models, they can also be used to improve weather models. And so if we, uh, you know, if one can show, and including this is also potentially even with a data assimilation, uh, if you can generate an improvement in weather models, you can truly improve the ability to forecast the weather using water isotopes. Uh, that's a big deal, right? That's kind of opening an entire new community into uh, water isotope science. So I'm going to quickly run through the kind of different types of high-resolution models. Um, so kind of a lot of the first ones were um, literally weather scale models or regional climate models. Um, these are similar to GCMs. And, you know, they still have parameterizations for most physical processes like convection, you know, thunderstorms or clouds, um, you know, the land surface, et cetera. Uh, however, they do are, they're at a smaller domain, so they'll capture things like topography a lot better because they're better able to resolve it. And these models are particularly good if you, uh, not only for downscaling, but also if you, uh, if you're studying, like, if you literally ran a field campaign on a single storm, right? Like, these models can capture individual sort of storms over several days. You can go higher resolution than that, and you can get to a spatial scale where you no longer need to parameterize convection. 
or you no longer need to parameterize these uh, small scale motions associated with things like storms. Um, the advantage of this is you get by getting rid of the parameterization, parameterization you've uh, kind of eliminated a source of uncertainty. Now, there's still things you have to parameterize, like cloud microphysics, um, but it still gives you a tool so that if, you're, if your GCM is getting a strange answer, but a cloud resolving model is getting the right answer, it might say, hey, maybe it is something to do with um, your convection scheme. Uh, and again, it allows you to kind of uh, test questions at smaller spatial scales. At the highest resolution, then there's also what's known as large eddy simulators or large eddy simulation models. There are a few large eddy simulating models. Um, I guess the reason they came to my mind is because my knowledge of uh, other Clivar projects related to things like clouds uh, heavily use LAS models. And um, LAS models, sorry, I guess the reason they're called large eddy simulators or simulation models is because they can simulate some of the dynamics of things like the boundary layer. Uh, so actually some of the large turbulent eddies, uh, the model is small enough to capture those, where almost every other model is to parameterize them. Um, so again, this is kind of like another step down. So if you have a spectrometer somewhere, you can ask, does the LAS model capture it? If it does, then you have a chance of, okay, maybe these higher, you know, the GCM or whatever does. But if the LAS model can't get your results, then there's probably no way a GCM is going to get those results either. And so this, again, allows a new way to test kind of physics processes related to uh, water isotopes. I also want to say all of those models are, of course, atmospheric, uh, but high resolution also matters in other spheres, including the ocean. Um, so, you know, Sam Stevenson has worked on a um, high resolution ocean model that allows you to capture um, kind of these smaller scale, you know, again, eddies and turbulent flows. Um, and what's important about this is, again, right, if you think about where proxies for um, the ocean, like corals, are taken, it's usually, like, near islands. And, of course, islands uh, aren't always necessarily representative of the open ocean uh, due to things like the bathymetry or the topography. Um, and so there might be dynamical influences that uh, are impacting your proxy but aren't impacting, but the GCM won't capture. But by using this high-resolution ocean model, you can capture this kind of what's known as mesoscale processes and might be able to kind of constrain what's driving the changes you see in your particular proxy. Um, finally, there are other high resolution global models in development, including uh, a version of NCAR's CAM model and then um, a true global cloud resolving model that Kei Yoshimura is working on called NICAM. Um, these are, again, these are great for process studies. They're probably not useful for paleo because they are very computationally expensive and you can't, you know, it's not really feasible to run them on paleo timescales. Um, finally, I just want to wrap up real quick and kind of, this is just, this is just my opinion, uh, but in my opinion of kind of what are the general issues with regard to water isotope modeling. And one of the real struggles is that we're kind of always behind. Right, like every time we get a new version of an isotope needle model, that version is probably behind the official version of that modeling system. Uh, or, on another case, it might be on a quote-unquote similar version, but it might be on a different subset of the physics or uh, the dynamics or the, you know, land surface, whatever. Um, the problem with this, then, is I want to say something about the model physics and say, like, hey, you should do X to improve the next generation, the response I'll get is, oh, but you're not using the latest version, or oh, you're on this weird side version, so why do I care about what you think? Um, so that's hard to get around. Uh, another thing, which isn't really anyone's fault, but it's just kind of something we have to deal with, is right now, we, uh, a, there's a lot, a lot of these topic observations are simply not ideal for global climate model uh, development or validation, right? Think of like GNIP, like GNIP has great spatial coverage in some places and is completely absent in others. So to really do a global validation can be difficult. Um, and then other things that give you global records like satellites, uh, you know, are, have somewhat short time scales, right? And there is no satellite isotope record that's 30 years long. Um, and then finally, there's some quantities which are just not observed. Uh, you know, so recently here, we had a discussion on rain evaporation in the GIFS model 
and one of the impacts was on the free tropospheric DXS. But the problem is there's like one observation of the free tropospheric DXS, so who knows what the answer should be. So, um, and then finally, I think both of these are somewhat related to the perception, and this is, again, this is my opinion, uh, perception of that water isotopes uh, outside of geochemistry and kind of paleo communities are just this like really niche subfield that, you know, it's not really important to the rest of climate science. And, you know, that comes in and say, like, why if, you know, in model development, it takes effort to add water type strips in or to keep them there. So why should we invest in isotopes? We can invest in whatever other random process. Um, because, you know, a lot of these models, there's all sorts of groups pushing for all sorts of processes, and we have limited time and, uh, you know, human resources. So I think one of the major takeaways, at least in my opinion for this Clivar, is that we can show, look, these are the benefits to water isotopes. This is why they matter in climate modeling. Uh, we might be able to change that perception and then fix a lot of these issues. Okay, that's it. Thanks.